Greetings, everybody, and welcome, welcome to this unfortunately uh, still most relevant session on the management of COVID. Most painful and horrifying, to given the millions who have died or suffered uh, from it or been otherwise impacted negatively by COVID. More than three years, more, more than, than three years, years on, many are still, many are still dying, dying and otherwise and otherwise to by COVID. Now, why did now, why millions die? And how can we help prevent more from dying? What does WHO need to do better now? What do governments need to do better now? To answer these difficult questions, but still very timely, we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished group of panelists with us for this session. Luigi, Luigi Cavalito, who's co-founder of Good Influences from Lebanon. Just raise your hand, uh, Cyprian. Good everyone. morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Cyprian Dan Costia, who is member of the board of Otonova in Romania. Senida Messi, who is a member of parliament and a former Deputy Prime Minister of Albania. Anne Aida, CEO of Small Business Association of Australia, in Australia. And Sandeep Pachpande, who is Chairman of ASM Global Institute in India. Welcome, welcome, dear panelists. For the next 43 minutes, we basically will be uh, engaging you on this again painful but but very typical uh, issue on what can we do better moving forward for me and i'll start perhaps with Rigi. any issue of of such sensitivity and and uh, impact requires significant credibility and trust but everything which we have been discussing or dealing with about COVID, whether it's origin, whether it's spread, the use of masks, impact of travel uh, on, 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 on its spread, uh, protection of self and others, the cure, the cure, reliable data, and advice, and advice, number of cases, number of deaths, side effects and, and real uh, benefits uh, of uh, vaccines, all have been marred by controversies and, and, and different uh, opinions uh, from otherwise most reliable and normally trustworthy sources which obviously is re, re, leading to a lot of confusion in the minds of people who do not now know who to trust and who not to trust on, on what are otherwise very difficult scientific medical uh, issues. What is your initial response to this going forward? Knowing what we know what happened in the last 20 and a half years, we don't need to rehearse everything what we know, all the controversies, all the... Uh, 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 arguments for against different positions, but for the average lay person, it, it must be extremely tough and confusing, and uh, to move to make any decision on a rational basis. So I'm like to ask your each actually each of you. I start with Luigi. What would be your your reaction to what I'm just telling you in terms of a, a sort of broad starting position? 
So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and uh, let me say that uh, I totally agree with you that everything starts with trust. Now, uh, as my name can say, uh, I'm uh, Italian. Like uh, I was born in Italy, despite uh, I'm living uh, in Lebanon in the humanitarian sector. And uh, in Italy, we have been affected from COVID from the very beginning. The very so beginning. when, uh, so like, when COVID, like COVID hit uh, Italy in the very beginning, it was literally like uh, more considered a kind of zombie apocalypse. And I'm sad to say this, but it was really like the, the fear was really in the street and uh, no one really need, knows, knew how, how to deal with this. Now, two years uh, and something later, uh, we have uh, achieved something in terms not of uh, a country, because no country is prepared and was prepared to do something, but as the world. But still, uh, there are some people that are opposing uh, the mayor view of even like COVID existing or not. Now, uh, I have a tendency of believing in science, uh, and this is something that is straightforward. So we need to base our decision not on our opinion, uh, but on what data can say to us, uh, what expert can say to us, uh, and what even experience can say to us. And after two years uh, of experience, uh, we have seen uh, that uh, the approach that are more extremist, so either you close everything and no one can do anything, or you don't close nothing, maybe are too much. So mm -hmm. there is a way in the middle, and maybe it's also like something that we have to deal with when we're generating trust if we want to move forward. So our society is too polarized right now. We are uh, living in difficult times, uh, and uh, for example, working in a context that is a humanitarian context, because aside of uh, uh, Lebanon, I got uh, to contribute to some uh, policies, uh, for example, uh, related to the Balkans or Afghanistan or other countries in Africa where uh, COVID is not the priority in terms of a problem that you have to solve. You have plenty of other humanitarian crises that are interconnected. Now we might have a food crisis, we might have other crises. So in this moment where the people are thinking, okay, how can I survive? And it's not only about COVID. Uh, the trust that you were talking about uh, among not only institutions and people, but even people on self-respect each others. And for example, right now we have some tools, masks are tools, vaccines are tools, uh, in order to move forward, to live, uh, and uh, to have the possibility to uh, take back what uh, we don't want to, to lose, uh, but in a kind of more rational way. It's feasible for the world, but it still is based on trust and respect. So uh, I don't think that uh, right now the majority of the people, to be honest, uh, are um, are still thinking that COVID is not existing or are still thinking that it's not affecting life or that people are dying. This is a slight minority and we are giving even too much space to some kind of con like a conspiracy. And, uh, and this has to stop in a way that uh, it should to be like free for everyone to express an opinion, but at a certain point we have to move forward and it's like, can we meet in the middle? Of course, to meet in the middle, uh, despite we have explained a lot, a lot, a lot, uh, now maybe instead of giving guidelines, uh, it's really like, okay, we are all in this together, we want to move forward. So as a civil civilized world, um, let's try to do be the best that we can. Sometimes... Uh, the best is the enemy of the good, so I think that uh, globally we need to focus on the good uh, in order to include people to move forward. Thank you very much, Luigi. Anne? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, and it is a great pleasure to be here today and for the opportunity to state um, my opinion. Uh, my interest lies with small business because I am the founder and I, we represent a lot of small businesses in Australia. I do agree. I think we all share the same sentiments, much the same as to what's gone on. But I do think, and I'm speaking about Australia because that's all I can comment about how we handle things here. And you've got two issues. You've got the population at large. Then in that population, you've got the impact of everything on small business. And small business right around the world is it represents about 97 maybe more percentage of all businesses so we've got to start looking at them as a very very important group of people and they are largely the forgotten people now the australian government did um they spent a lot of money on various financial things to assist business during the lockdowns 
uh, we've got a, a trillion dollar debt, a trillion dollar debt. And we had, uh, but not everybody got the help that they needed. It was only certain size businesses. Uh, one of my great criticisms is that I think we could have handled things a lot better in some ways because when we, we not only closed down the borders internally within Australia, but we closed them down internationally. As you know, we're an island. So nobody, if you're an Australian national, you couldn't come in or go out. It was as simple as that. And people couldn't even come into Australia. This is where I think the whole thing fell down. It created a lot of disunity. It created conspiracy theories and a whole range of things. People would want to come for emergency funerals for a very, very close loved one. Like say your father, somebody's dying in hospital. They were not allowed to go in. Then we had things like next minute you had big football clubs needed to hold a match. And one week later, tens of thousands are there without their masks on and they're holding a match. And your person couldn't come in for a funeral. That created, and that's a very, very bad thing that went on. And there is no, and, and then also people, business owners, for example, and even workers, if you were in most industry, there are many industries, if you are not vaccinated, you lost your job. And if you're a business owner, you could not operate your business. If you're a retailer, for example. So people were denied the right to earn a living. That still exists to a great degree at the moment. And even like the police force, which traditionally in Australia, they, the police, the population respects and so forth, they were in some states, they were threatened that they would be disciplined and fired from their positions or sacked from their positions if they were not vaccinated. So I believe that there could have been other measures taken. And I do understand the pandemic and I understand the, um, the concerns and the danger that went on. But the media kept reporting things every day. And I do have a serious criticism in this area where they were frightening the living daylights out of people. They didn't explain how many people survived because a lot of people survived. They kept talking about the deaths and of course every day, and it's very tragic that is, we had a lot of people die in our aged care facilities because that was very badly handled. There's a lot of, lot of recrimination about that at the moment. So whilst, and we are a wonderful country, but we ended up by becoming the most highly vaccinated country in the world. And yet today, we are supposed to have the highest rate of the latest um, COVID, you know, the milder version. So I can't quite explain that. So to me, we need to look at a few things. Business has been affected. We are facing very, very headwinds. And I suspect globally, um, the supply chains have been broken. This is creating, of course, inflation and other pressures that will have an effect on the population. And so there's a lot of things happening there that I do not believe governments are tackling. I believe that they have taken action without thinking, forward thinking about what these actions may do. And unfortunately, small business, and small business goes under. In Australia, they are still the single largest, single largest employer in the Australian economy. They're having a tough time at the moment. They're in what we call a recovery mode. Uh, for Australia, we have unique problems more so than other countries because we are, are far away from everywhere. So freight costs are very, very high now because fuel is going up. I think, I think what needs to be done is to tackle things on two fronts, economic and also the health side of things, that probably there can be better coordination and not so much as the media to sensationalise things, but provide the facts because they are responsible for a lot of rubbish that's gone on in this country. And so, and then of course in Australia, we had very, very large demonstrations uh, calling the whole thing a conspiracy. And we're talking about some of the largest demonstrations I've ever seen in this country. So we have to tackle two areas. Governments need to tackle the business side of things. Fuel's going up in Australia. One um, importer the other day told me, he said what was costing him $500 to import into Australia is now at least 10 times that amount. He said, I can't pass that on and he will be going most likely out of business. So we've got to start looking at how do we 
provide employment, sustain small businesses, because small business can play a massive role in the recovery of the economy, massive. But they are usually, and I'm not against big business because I deal with big business, but it's all about big business these, you know, it has been for ages. Let's see how we can include and involve small business for recovery, for jobs, et cetera. And then we've got to also look after the health and well-being. And I think this is maybe where coordination between countries at a better level can take place. So in short, if I had to say, and I know it's easy to criticise with the wisdom of hindsight, but I would think that I would have liked to have seen things handled a lot differently and with a bit more compassion at the end of the day. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> great word of, of compassion there. Uh, and uh, Cyprian. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will try to explain to you some things from my point of view, which are based on more positions that I have. Because, uh, yes, I am actually associated mainly with the Autonova group of companies, because we are also a group of companies, but I'm also here in Romania, member of the board of the National Credit Guarantee Fund, which is a governmental institution, and the most important and the single one, which is providing guarantees on behalf of the government for the small medium enterprises of Romania. And I'm also involved in politics. Uh, what we had uh, during the pandemic, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic, we were talking here about the trust. It was a lack of trust of people in the government's decision. And this came because, you know, in the government, there are politicians. Because the politicians were very divided with their opinions of how to handle the pandemic. And I think that um, uh, during that times should have been more negotiations, more discussions between the political decision makers and the government branches, which should have a more unified uh, and more concentrated approach towards the pandemic. Of course, the time was going on and uh, slowly, slowly the science, the doctors uh, became more uh, aware about what's happening with this coronavirus. Also the vaccines appeared and the most and most people now are vaccinated this moment, I think that uh, the government should approach two basic things. First, uh, here in Europe, one of the main concerns of the people is the employment. And for this purpose, the government should address with special policies the unemployment issue, especially within the young people. Second, uh, the governments must sustain the private sector, especially the small businesses, the medium-sized businesses, uh, and I'm very proud to say that here in Romania, uh, we are providing through the fund the most important policies that the Romanian government uh, decided to implement uh, for the private sector. And we helped a lot of companies to survive during these difficult times. On the third line, I think that it's very, very important to have a much common approach between the government and, and the society. The government must be more transparent must be more present with very, very good explanations on media so that all the people do understand everything that is happening. Here in Europe, and especially in Romania now, of course the pandemic is under control here in Europe. Uh, there are no restrictions actually, very few restrictions. But here, the war from Ukraine came across the uh, pandemic. And the situation is very difficult now, and we are feeling in Romania a pressure in the society and also in the economy because of the war. So now, actually, the government has managed the two sides of the problems, which is still the pandemic existing, and the second one is the effects of the war. Uh, in the future, I repeat, the governments must have a very, very transparent uh explanation of their policies through all the media channels that it's possible to to uh use so that the people do understand everything that they decide and this will help to regain the trust between society and the government and this is i think the key the basic key the major key to make a good management for the pandemic what we are seeing now in the world, there are still different models of managing the pandemic. Mm. Here in Europe, for example, with very, very few restrictions, as I told you. In China, for example, we are seeing still lockdowns. And my opinion is that even globally, 
even globally, the countries should discuss, should negotiate within the United Nations, within the World Health Organization, so that we can find a more common approach because the pandemic is global and we need a global response. Individual responses cannot help anybody. Thank you very much, Shabian. Senida, can I can we hear your, your thoughts, please? Greetings, everybody. Yes, I was uh, listening very carefully, even what uh, uh, the other panelists were saying. But uh, to say the truth, uh, okay, being in both two sides, being even in the side of the government and in the parliament in my country in Albania, but even as an active member of society, definitely um, all the countries were faced in something new, something global. And uh, there, is, there was no rule what to follow in this case. So somehow we learn even, even by doing. Definitely, yes, politician, politics or uh, Ministry of um, uh, Health in this uh, direction needed to control somehow even the information. Because um, in a lot of cases we saw that uh, the information, uh, I don't know, um, we call it here, but even with um, WHO here, it's kind of uh, together with pandemic, we had even an infodemic. So listening a lot of uh, information, uh, spread it a lot of information digitally, social media, but uh, this infodemic was leading even to a confusion and risk-taking behaviors that can even harm uh, the health and uh, automatically because of this infodemic, was created even a mistrust in health authorities and public health responses. If we see what the governments were doing, it's one thing. If we see or if we saw what the media was doing, was completely another thing. What was good in this direction, in my opinion, is that suddenly the TVs were full of uh, professionals and medical doctors, not with politicians or opinionists telling about what we should do. <coughs> But even in this case, uh, there was not such an approach or a scientific evidence-based approach in this case, because there was not in that time before two years a scientific-based approach to treat and to speak uh, based on a study or based on a, on a trial. It was something new, so therefore even the medical doctors and all the media were distributing news, but not, not properly, but for sure they were not double-checked. Uh, so definitely it created a confusion between all the countries in the world. Having in mind, okay, uh, what a country should uh, take in consideration and what a government have taken in consideration is that uh, somehow they needed to control the information because nobody was sure what was happening. Nobody was, was sure uh, if this situation is going to long last or long or to uh, uh, bring um, a lot of um, um, deaths and a lot of uh, problems into the public health management. What I saw, unfortunately, was kind of a reporting deaths and number and not really explaining <coughs> the process and uh, really distributing the news that we need to be, at least we need to be careful. So a lot of panic for sure in the beginning. And now uh, what I see, I don't know, I think we need to focus in some lesson learned. Huh? Do we, humanity, learn something out of this or we simply forgot all about and then, yes, we are living our life as it was before, almost as it was before two years ago. But are we learning something? It looks like, uh, I don't know, your universe or God is sending us signals or, um, but still we are, I don't know, we have this short term memory. Or because we as a humans wouldn't like to remember the bad days, but simply would like to live life and remember only the good days. But definitely what we should take in consideration after this experience is that the media should be focused into the scientific based approach. Now we have two years. There are some studies, uh, there are some uh, figures, there are some analysis, and definitely we should be focusing in this direction. Research and interventions is very much um, important. To disseminate this information, uh, you need to create kind of a good network and uh, somehow formulate it policy and building even a governmental structure to support infodemic management. And because even in the government uh, unit, there were not such a structure to really 
uh, manage the information, be it within, uh, inside out, but even what was out and processing and processing in. So yeah, basically this is kind of uh, my thoughts and uh, I do believe that uh, the government actually need this kind of infodemic and uh, health advocacy to put it in the public health management as well, because it's very much, we saw how much is important to inform people with the right information to control, not to control for the bad uh, connotation, the information, but to make sure that the information is distributed to the public is the right one, is based on research, and is the one that the public should hear. I know that with the media, social media, it's very much difficult, but at least it's the role of the government to do impossible and to make this kind of evidence-based research and transmit this kind of evidence-based and uh, based on scientific research. This is at least the role of the government. Then how the media is distributing the news, then definitely they are trying or they are looking for scoops, they are looking for good, uh, good news, they are looking for followers and likes and stuff like this. So it's very much um, difficult, but uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, possible. Thank you very much, Sanita. Uh, Santi, please <coughs> share your views. Yeah, uh, thank you very much and uh, <coughs> greetings to everyone. Wonderful to be a part of this panel. Uh, this is one of the crises which has affected everyone globally. And one of the uniqueness about this crisis is no one knows where, when it's going to end. <laughs> and uh, uh, in a country like India, which is so big and diverse with such a large population, it was a very, very big challenge. And uh, there has been a lot of mistrust. There has been a lot of uh, uh, anger. And yes, there has been a lot of problems, especially to certain sections of the society and to certain sectors. I belong to the education sector. And we just opened up just three months back. For two years, we were in a lockdown. Uh, the, the good news is, yes, the coronization, as I call it, has uh, made education adopt technology at a very high rate. So yes, we moved to adoption of technology. Education did not stop. However, the paradox, as Annie also said, was that you're not allowed to go to school, whereas you're allowed to go to see a movie or to a mall. And in the states in India where elections are there, you have lakhs of people attending rallies. <laughs> Uh, so, so yes, so this this was a mistrust coming into it, and with the media, uh, you know, I was in one of the panels in the media side. What happened during the pandemic was the print went out of uh, publications, and everything came real time. And most of the channels now have moved to twenty four hours format. So the journalists and the channels are pressed to getting breaking news and sensationalizing the news, and since mm -hmm. it's real time. They really don't get time to authenticate it as properly as they would have wanted to do it. And um, again, in the media, the so-called WhatsApp University, uh, or you know, people just spreading things without really uh, authenticating whether it is right or wrong has been put in. Having said all this, uh, I look at it. You know, let me look at the positives. Let me put in the positive side since I'm speaking almost at the end of it. I, I believe that every crisis provides an opportunity and there have been number of positives which has come out of this crisis and the way to go forward. I think education is something which is going to play a very critical role. Uh, one of the things what we saw as positives is the humanitarian angle of people coming together, people trying to work together, help each other, even unknown people. And I have a case uh, with myself where I had my 15 year old son who invented a, a box, a do-it-yourself kit, which can help prevent the spread of the COVID virus. And uh, uh, he, he wanted to make it a social venture. It was difficult to get funding from government bodies as they were all busy in providing food and vaccines as the main priority. And in fact, Pune is the city from uh, where we have the Punawala group, where we have been leading the war against uh, COVID with the vaccines being provided uh, from Pune. And ironically, we didn't. We got the vaccines very late, though they were manufactured in our city uh, itself. But uh, the positives here I saw is kids coming together. Like for, for my son, when he wanted to give it to the underprivileged and needy and the frontline workers who are the most affected, he created a course on crowdfunding 
got 2000 uh, high school students to do the course and run crowdfunding campaigns where they raised more than 3 million rupees and donated this to the underprivileged and needy people. And we found out that more than 80% of the people in India have <clears> donated <throat> during COVID. They have around 60% of the people in India have volunteered for the, uh, to helping others uh, as such. Um, again, uh, technology uh, has been adopted in education. Uh, we believe that if you educate people in the right way, the only way to combat COVID is prevention. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we cannot let a guard down. We have to continue to follow the protocols. Uh, we have to educate the children and, and the youth also on, uh, you know, how to make sure that, uh, we, you know, we increase our immunity from inside. Ultimately, it's just a virus. So if you increase our immunity, if you take care of the protocols, I think prevention is the best cure as far as this crisis is concerned. And um, it's being a global crisis, it is very essential uh, that um, everyone uh, comes together and the media, the politicians, the government and the people uh, will have to find a common ground and making sure that we all fight this uh, together. And um, it, it, uh, the learnings, I think, are there where we can probably uh, handle it much better the next time as such. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I would just end with the things that, yes, uh, there are a lot of positives also to be taken from this. And I hope in the future, uh, things will get better. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Uh, th and thank you all for, for your uh, initial uh, responses. W what I clearly can highlight from your responses is uh, looking what uh, situation is uh, in the real world out there is that I think deep down, nobody can, can dispute the fact that COVID has had and is still having a significant, dramatic impact on people's health and on our way of life. Uh, our, our countries, our social fabric, our, our economic uh, 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 environment has been, uh, in some cases, shattered. And, and in other cases, impacted very severely. And we're still feeling the, the brunt of it. Uh, and as Anne mentioned, whether in terms of small businesses, in terms of our own ability to purchase uh, basic uh, needs are now being uh, under, under threat. So there are serious implications. And I think where the discussion uh, uh, takes a different turn and, and it's, it's very much the focus of our discussion today, where there's a lack of consensus, is very much more about what needs to be done, right? About, um, let, let's not talk about the, the economic and political dimension and social implications, which are serious enough, but purely on the health uh, aspect of, of COVID. There, even on that level, which, as Rigi said, should be based on science and, and, and facts and, and figures, there's still no consensus. <clears throat> and I think you all identified one area, which is the lack of trust. Now, lack of trust mm -hmm. cannot be remedied by imposing trust or by uh, expecting it. It has to be earned somehow. And based on what went wrong so far, I mean, we can go all go back to, uh, as I said again, it's not about uh, putting blame on or, or uh, being wise after the event, but we all, it's not so long ago that WHO was basically uh, advocating that masks had no role to play in the prevention of the uh, the virus. Uh, so that's a fact. This is on record. Uh, this is what the WHO, who everybody's looking up to, uh, was saying, and governments were following suit. So obviously that had to be changed very quickly. And the same is about the vaccines, uh, whereas, you know, uh, I think perhaps there's no shortcut to education, as Sam did say. Maybe education has been, uh, in a way, uh, un um, undervalued in terms of building that trust. More explanation, uh, there's no shortcut, because maybe, especially if people feel they're right, right does not uh, obviate the need to educate people for people to believe it is right, too. Uh, because telling people that you're right and uh, is not enough. You have to explain why, because people need to know, especially when it's touching their own health, health of their loved ones, 
they need to understand they they will obviously respect uh, if they believe and trust that the person giving that information is uh, reliable credible and is also basically uh, living what they're saying is that an area where i think governments and even who need to spend more time on because in many ways uh, you had the issues with the number of deaths recently okay governments have announced uh, x millions the who is saying actually no it's many more millions than that so now people are losing trust even in the numbers. Uh, mm-hmm. So vaccines, you had recently, Sandeep, you had the Supreme Court of India had a, a, a basically a incredible decision, uh, huge impact worldwide in terms of the need for governments to be more uh, open about data on vaccines to allow people to make the right decisions. So I think a lot of, if you want, a need for people to share reliable data but how do we get there how do we get people to better accept that data being shared is reliable is trustworthy uh because does who need to do more to to show itself as being more reliable uh maybe uh, uh admit uh, initial mistakes and say that we've learned all learned from uh, the first two years and how can we make things better rather than saying, well, we, we, we were never wrong, we can never be wrong. Uh, what, 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 what do you think, uh, uh, Cyprian? Are you, unmute, please. Okay, so my opinion is that, uh, as you said, there must be uh, international discussion within the governments. There must be a very professional sharing of the information. Everybody knows that uh, at the beginning, everybody was surprised in the world about the pandemic. And for obvious reasons, uh, we had to accept that the lockdowns were mandatory at the beginning. In this moment, according to the science data that we have in the world, in all the world, in all the countries, we can say, and I think that I can emphasize that lockdowns are not good anymore in this moment of the pandemic. Education has a very central role. Of course, we know that there is a very difficult access to education in a lot of countries in the world. And we must provide for this a global response too, so that more and more people will get educated and will understand when professionals, when people with high trust from medical side, for example, will come through the media channels and to explain the figures about how the pandemic is going on. But my opinion, my strong belief, is that in the future we need no any more lockdowns, but we need individual responsibility. So each people must prevent to catch a coronavirus. Of course, it's impossible to 100% prevent, but if you are cautious, if you are taking care of yourself and the people from around you, you can manage to have a normal life without having a government-imposed lockdown. I think that in the future, the life must come back to normality. And to achieve this goal, we need to internationally discuss within, as I told you already, the United Nations, the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization, we know that at the beginning, they were really not knowing exactly what to recommend. And it was normal. I understand now the positions that the World Health Organization had at the beginning of the pandemic. But now, after two years of experience, I think that after discussing with the country members, the World Health Organization can have a global response style of uh, framework for each country to follow with basic rules, with no lockdown recommendations, and with individual responsibility for each people when managing the situation with the coronavirus. Of course, the situation is still difficult. And as I told you, now here in Europe, at least we are feeling also the pressure from the world. But we are discussing here about the coronavirus. We are feeling that as long as we are vaccinated, as long as now the doctors know what to prescribe when somebody gets this coronavirus, we can come back to normality. And my strong belief is that in each part of the world, in each country, we can have such an approach. Life is going on 
and must follow the light without all these restrictions which are affecting of course also the economy the the, the society and they are generating the kind of stress in the society at one moment people uh, are getting bored of staying in, in lockdowns people do not want to stay in lockdowns people just want to have a normal life but for this purpose they need to be also individually uh, responsible about their day-to-day -day life their daily activities and so on but but to achieve this individual responsibility we must help the people to educate themselves to understand what's happening and to understand how they can be individually responsible and follow some global guidelines which may come from the world health organization thank you very much Shapiro. we've got literally uh, four and a half minutes left what i'd like to ask you actually as a follow-up to um, Cyprian's point, uh, each one of you, uh, basically no more than one minute, in terms of, uh, given the, the need for a global response and the need for a coordination at the global level, because viruses have no borders. Uh, so what more can WHO do as of today? Senida. Um. So definitely what I'm thinking is that first, uh, everybody, not simply WHO, should have a human-centered approach. This is much important rather than figures, numbers, who is doing what in politics and policies and stuff like this. So the human-centered of your approach should be uh, uh, adopted in all the countries with or without help of the WHO. But WHO as a UN organization definitely should have the leading role. Second, we need to, uh, to understand that um, all the countries that here in the WHO, uh, they simply try to get their, um, uh, their experience, their recommendations, but it's not, uh, uh, not recommended. But even by the rules of WHO, uh, it's not uh, absolutely so. The national authority has the right to choose whatever they think is best for their people. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day what WHO is saying because the countries uh, cannot bind or by laws and regulations are not yet, let's say, 100% binding what WHO is saying. So in this sense, what I'm trying to say is a WHO role, it's a recommendation, it's a consultant role. They, yes, uh, they put some uh, rules and regulations and try to help the people, but at the end of the day, national authorities has all the right and the decision making to do whatever they seem or for them whatever they seem uh, uh seem that is good for their own people in my view and recommendation is that the health workers and scientists uh, should be as a backbone of this process because they know better this kind of situation and uh government from one side and media should listen first to them Thank and then uh, transmit whatever uh whatever is needed to be transmitted but they should be the center of information. Thank you, uh, Sandeep. 30 seconds, please. Uh, yes, so I, I think, you know, we, we all agree that uh, we have to have a human-centered and holistic approach uh, to, to this whole thing. And uh, what we should be looking at is how we can prevent it, how we can educate more people with the minimum basic uh, rules. And I think it cannot be have uh, one solution fits everyone. But there has to be common minimum global guidelines and certain guidelines which can be put in locally, depending on the situation and the local environment. Uh, so education, prevention, and basically improving our own health and immunity, I think, are the key things for the future. Thank you very much. Luigi. Yeah, thank you very much for the panel. Uh, to be honest, I think that we are literally living in exponential times, uh, very accelerated. So it's not only the virus that is mutating faster, uh, but also our institution that sometimes they lack uh, this ability to adapt to the situation. So uh, we started with the truth. Uh, and uh, I really think that now, also as Senida was pointing out, it's more about the social contract where who has to be involved. So it's not about an institution where some... Uh, uh, potentially very smart and educated people are working to take decision for all, as also Sandeep was saying, but more uh, something like, hey, we are a UN institution, we are a UN body that every day is committed to adapt in order to find the several different guidelines uh, for different situations. Because what uh, also Sandeep put on the table, and I want to put also like a uh, 
the perspective from Lebanon or other like uh, southern countries uh, is that sometimes the country that uh, literally like produce uh, the vaccine doesn't have it, but sometimes also we have several uh, interconnected refugee crises uh, for war, for climate emergency and something, uh, and you have uh, tons of people, we are talking about uh, hundreds of millions of people, they are not even participating to this game, unfortunately, that we are playing as humanity. Because they don't have a vaccine, they don't have uh, any kind of sanitation, they don't have any place uh, where to stay and to hide and to stay in lockdown. So when we have to consider what uh, the World Health Organization can do better is to adapt uh, in order to answer uh, to really different uh, problems uh, of a humanity made by more than 7 billion people and not by a couple of billion that are staying only on a very, like, uh, let me say, well-developed part of the world. Thank you. And please. Yes, thank you very much. And I think most of us agree with uh, each other as to what has transpired and what needs to be done. But just briefly, I think we have to reinstate somehow, I'm not too sure how, but trust in not only our own governments, we have to stop socially engineering our population because that's what I felt we did with all the lockdowns and so forth. And we are still paying that penalty even now. And we need to reinstate also trust in uh, bodies such as the WHO. If I may just quickly add, and this is political and it's very important to, to understand this. As you probably know, Australia and uh, there's a very big stouch going on between Australia and China at the moment, which is a shame. And there's going to be a meeting, I believe, held very soon after our federal election, which will be sometime next week with the WHO. So already in Australia, there are people already going like mad with all these theories that if the W, if we sign over our medical rights, etc., this is Australia and other countries, that China will rule us and do this and that. Now that's all wrong. And we somehow have to stop this silly nonsense. And I think we need to, co I, I, I do like the idea of coordination. I do like the idea of a plan. And I do understand that every country's position may be a little bit different from each other. But I think most importantly, we have to live with whatever's going on because um, people get sick just like they do with the flu. And, and, and when you don't talk about the flu, when we used to get it, nobody used to worry too much. You'd go to the doctors. Unfortunately, people did die from that as well. But I don't, but I think, and I think we need to do something with the media because I think they played a very, very major role because they used to shut down anybody that dared to um, view, to air a different viewpoint. And in a democracy, people feel they have a right to express their view, which is a freedom of choice. And that was basically denied in Australia, which is a very, very sad thing because we value ourselves as a great, as a great democratic country. So these are all the issues we have to do something with. I'm not sure how we're going to, to reinstate that trust because already there are conspiracy theories still rolling around. Yeah, thank you very much. No, honestly, we, we, we've run out of time. And I just want to, to thank you again, uh, Anne, uh, Sanida, Rigi, Tripian and Sandeep for, for your insight. Uh, obviously, it, it, we are touching the surface in terms of how we can we can help make things better moving forward. What everybody should have learned from the past two years and, and moving forward, what more we can do. Uh, but I think key to that is the need for uh, for for communication. I think uh, proper, effective communication based on trust, uh, because communication is not only based on trust, but it actually nourishes trust. If, if, as Anne said, you refuse to engage and, and you basically shut down people who dare to air a different view, then you, you're, you're only encouraging or breeding conspiracy theories because, whereas on the other hand, if you actually engage the right people with the right credentials who can speak authoritatively uh, to the people and explain what's going on and what needs to be done and why it should be done, people are more likely to, to embrace and, and endorse uh, and, and actually do so willingly. But I think trust is key. And I think in the forming of, of policies, whether globally at the WHO level or nationally, I think it should be based on credibility, on compassion, on education, uh, on integrity. 
and on equity so that uh, it's actually not actually having different remedies for different types of people or different regions it should be a, a global remedy uh, equitably available <clears throat> to all uh, so that the whole of humanity benefits from it so on that note ladies and gentlemen thank you very much thank you to our participants thank you to horizes and of course please continue to contribute to that debate and discussion moving forward because we do need healthy minds to prevail thank you very thank much thank you all have a great right, nice day bye everybody thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you. bye have a nice day thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye bye yeah, thank you thank you